five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the A Day Podcast. What is up, A-Day Podcast people? Welcome to episode number three of the podcast. This one's a good one. This one's a damn good one. I've always been an MMA fan. uh, For since, I think my first MMA event that I watched was uh, Chuck Liddell and Rampage Jackson. So to have this guest on right now is pretty sweet deal. Uh, So just quick rule before we get started, before I bring Chelsea in, uh, if you have a question for me, if you have a question for Chelsea, just make sure you put at the A-Day podcast in the chat room, just so I can see it, just so I notice it. Otherwise it'll fly by. I won't notice anything. And then you guys will think I'm a massive dick. So let's bring in our friend, Chelsea Ray. Say hi, Chelsea. What up? How's everybody (laughs) doing? That's my hand. (laughs) All right, so let's get first things first. I mean, February 22nd, fighting in Tough Enough, coming off a big win. How are you feeling after that? I mean, it's been, what, a week? Yeah, I'm fat. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, but to be real, I feel feel amazing. Um, We'll probably dive deeper into all this as we go on, but uh, to give you a snapshot, um, I've been training three and a half years now. And uh, I lost my first fight in October. Um, And then we went ahead and and got the win here February 22nd. So it was a a big thing to overcome. Um, But just in life, like everybody has a story. Um, And so to finally get that win really kind of vanquished a lot of inner demons that I had. It was just like war is over, you know. And um, it was just a big moment for me. So, yeah, I feel really renewed and... um, But as far as an athlete goes, I'm fat. I'm (laughs) like eating everything I can find. And um, I'm starting to slow that down. I think everybody kind of gives himself a week to be crazy. Your body needs it too after you go through a big weight cut. For sure. Things get out of control real quick. So (laughs) um, I've been trying to move some more. I did go to an open mat on Friday to kind of get my blood going. But uh, we're going to be all systems go again tomorrow and getting back at it. So like, and and the girl you fought... um, I forget her name. Oh, Allison Goodwin. Like she was no tomato can either. Like she was two and zero. Yeah, she was two and zero. Um, she fought her first. Still, I don't know when she found time to fight all these other girls, but like they gave me the fight. Uh, they presented that to me in January, like early January, and um, she had just fought in December, I believe it was. That was her debut. And then by the time we got to weigh-ins, she was 2-0. and And I was like, who and where and when and how? <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, you know what I mean? But yeah, she'd fought a couple girls. So, and, and trying to find a, a copy of the fight that I can watch has been a pain in the you-know-what. Yeah. But how did the fight go, like, for those of us who haven't seen it, who haven't been able to see it? Um, it went very well. Um, it, so... I've watched like three quarters of it and I'm really, really hard on myself. Like I know um, my performance improved exponentially from fight one to fight two. Um, But you always want to do better. I don't know if anyone watched the card last night and, um, but John Jones had some good things to say where, you know, he didn't really win in John Jones fashion last night. And when you're on that level, which I'm not, but I can imagine you always want to win exciting and brutal. And you know, I don't think he was excited about a decision over Anthony Smith, but what he did have to say was some days you come out here and you don't perform as best you would like to, but you still get the job done and you yeah. go back to the drawing board and you find more. So I'm very happy with how I performed overall. Um, I was kind of bored watching it back, but <laughs> it's, it, it's me fighting. So anyway, to like paraphrase the fight, I came out pretty hot throwing hard strikes and I got her backed up against the cage. Um, And we wall wrestled a lot. In the second round, I was able to pull off a couple takedowns. One of those takedowns put me in a poor position. Um, In the third round, 
and she took my back and she tried to choke me. Um, there was about 25 seconds left when she was on my back. Um, she slipped it into my chin for about a full second. It did get tight, but I wasn't going to tap either way. And I thought, you've worked way <laughs> too hard, especially since you've kicked someone's ass for almost six minutes straight. You're not letting this go. You're going to find a way to get out of here and win this fight. And so um, I did. And, I, you know, I'm proud of that. I'm happy that I could get that win for my team. They worked really hard to get behind me. And uh, we executed our game plan beautifully, which was just that, you know, come in, use your strikes, get her backed up, find the takedown, beat her up. And that's what we did every round. Do you find that, like, so you've been in two fights so far. Yeah. Do you find that when you, like, you prepare so much for these fights, this isn't just like a, a hobby like this where I can turn on a camera and interview somebody for a couple hours yeah. or an hour or whatever. Like, you, every day, you guys are training your butts off. Do you find yeah. that when you get into that cage and, and the ref says go, that you just kind of go into, like, a reaction mode? Like, it's just not, you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like an out-of-body yeah. thing. Yes, so my first fight was way more out of body, like weird, like <laughs> like almost felt like I wasn't in my body, super weird, and that's normal right here, and I hear that that's normal for quite a few fights, and that it can even resurface, and I think we kind of saw something <laughs> like that happen in Woodley last night, where it was just like, we know Woodley's way more capable than what he showed, but he just wasn't home, and yeah. he couldn't find his way home, and so I don't feel like I was that far out, I feel like I just had a first fight um, performance and I fought the first time, but this time I said right away when we got done, because um, Jesse Jessica Rose Clark, who coaches me, was like, How do you how'd you feel? How do you feel? How's your cardio? And I was like, dude, I felt like I could go for days. <laughs> there like I felt great. I felt a hundred times better in there than I did my first fight. Um, and so there's a real thing to be said for Kate experience, like the minutes you spend spend in there. And I remembered thinking when I when once I stepped in and I got to my corner. I looked around the cage and I was like, we're home because you spend so much time like sparring and stuff in a cage and it yep. like the first, the first fight I remember getting in there and feeling good. I wasn't nervous really, honestly, but I remember looking around thinking this is real foreign. And this time <laughs> when I got in there, I was like, we're home, let's go. And I could not wait for the freaking ref to say fight. Cause I was <laughs> ready. Yeah. So, First off, Whit Cranford says, tell Chelsea I'm proud of her stepping in the ring. Brave one she is. Uh, thank you so much. You're the brave one. No kidding. Right? We, were, <laughs> we, we were actually talking about you right before we started this podcast. Uh, just saying like, you know, we're watching YouTube videos and you're doing all this kind of stuff that makes you think like, well, what's my excuse, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've um, got to be... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. What were you going to say? I was just going to reiterate what I was telling you earlier with, with someone like Wit. You know, it's like... I know that I'm fortunate and blessed to be this healthy. And so that's part of why I fight. Like I have an able body to use to help inspire other people and, and to get something done. I, that's part of what I want to push myself as far as I can go. And so it's always an inspiration to see somebody like you that, that has by standard has an excuse to not do much of anything. So I, I always wake up and go, Think of people like yourself and go, well, what's my, like, I don't have a valid one. <laughs> even if you're sick, even if you're sore, even if you're mildly injured, you really don't have an excuse. And you can still do something. Just because you can't go 100% doesn't mean you can't go 30, 50, whatever. You know? Exactly. Exactly. So before this, you did a lot of music. Like, I know you came out with an album. Uh, do you still dabble in music at all? Or is your focus just 100% MMA for right now? So, I've been dabbling again. Um, it's something that, so when I started training in MMA, I was full-fledged pursuing a country music singing and songwriting career and was starting to have some marginal success with some stuff like with some small-time cuts on some independent records and things like that. Right. Um, but it wasn't fun anymore. Uh, it just, you get burnt out on things no matter how much you love them and Sometimes it's important to take a break. And so fighting was something that I'd always wanted to do. And um, I thought, okay, because breaking into the music business is difficult. And you have to have a niche. And I thought, cool, if I can get my fighting skills to a certain level, then fighting will promote music and music will promote fighting. And that sets me apart in both arenas. So um, for a long time there, I wasn't even interested in, 
and doing anything musical. It just didn't even strike me as fun. Um, in the last six months or so, I've been kind of getting that bug. So I've been uh, talking to some guys to get together and do a show. Um, would like to would like to perform before this summer, you know. Right. Um, it's just been a matter of scheduling and everything. And fighting is my number one focus, and it will be until I win the championship belt for the UFC. Heck but, yeah. Uh, yeah, but um, I miss music, and I think it's important to have – uh, other things, other hobbies, other pursuits, and uh, shelf life and fighting is short. So I always yeah. want to have a few irons in the fire, getting ready for. You know, at some point, I'll I'll throw in the glove. You know, that's a good way to think about it, though. Too is, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, a fighter's career compared to any other career is short. Well, and I started late too. You know, I started at 25. I'm 29 now. Um, I'm healthy. You know, everything's fine, but you also reach points in life as you get older. Like, I don't want to train this. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, there's going to come a point where I wake up and go, mm, maybe something else. So I'm always trying, and it's fun. You know, I, I'm always, I love business. Um, so I'm always kind of trying to stay ahead of the curve and build my brand and do all those kind of things. And sure. so music, music's part of that for me. So on a weird, interesting side note, we talked about a couple of viewers that we're going to have today. One is your mother. One is my mother. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason, the moms decided to show up. Uh, your mom just typed in, this is all good news to her mama. Oh. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess I haven't talked a lot about it. I've been trying to sort of keep things under wraps until we really had something to offer. But I'm really, like, excited about, you know, doing more of that. And so I thought I'd let you guys know. And that holds me accountable. That means I have to go do it because now there's an expectation for me to actually <laughs> perform. So... That's fine by me. We'll get it done. So, I mean, you're you're doing the music thing. You're kind of just plugging along. And uh, why? Why fighting? Uh, well, the story goes that when I was six, um, so my dad worked on the road a lot. He's been in construction my whole life. And so he wasn't home that much. It was usually like a weekend thing. Um, there was a short time, though, where he worked close to home. And we, uh, on Tuesday nights, had to two night fights and it was like low level pro boxing or like amateur hour or something but it was our thing and so that's what we'd watch together we had like a little bunny eared tv with foil on it <laughs> and um he used to talk he was a big boxing fan like his dad was a boxing fan and like would teach you know him and my uncle about it and so he kind of took that on as his tradition too so he was like these guys run you know five miles a day or whatever he told me about how these guys were just warriors and I thought, how cool. You know, I was a big Power Rangers fan at that age and stuff. So I thought they oh, were yeah, like Power real... Rangers. Yeah, I thought they were like <laughs> real Power Rangers, you know. So I was like, I want to be one of those. And um, I started doing like a bunch of push-ups and stuff. And then I was like, Dad, Dad, I'm going to be a boxer. And he was like, yeah, no, you know. And so I'm like, what do you mean? And then he was like, I'm like, okay, cool. My friend Tony does karate. Can I do some karate? And he was like, no, that's stupid. We like boxing. I'm like, but you won't let me do that. So I just, gr growing up, I played a ton of sports. I played baseball with the boys from five to 13 years old and did, you know, did pretty well with, with that, but it gets to a certain point where it's really not feasible to keep doing it because there's yeah. no future in it. Um, and those guys got way bigger and stronger than me at that age. So it was just done. I got into track and field. I did soccer to stay in shape. I became a runner. Did a half marathon, did a Tough mutter in my early 20s, and it was like, yeah, it was cool. But I was looking for something that was going to push me to the point of going, I could have died. Or like, damn, <laughs> I really, like, I just wanted to get done and be like, wow, I made it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And nothing had pushed me to the point. So I started to toy with the idea of maybe even doing like an Ironman or something, training for that. And then that just sounded boring. So um, from the time I'd fallen in love with boxing, which... What intrigued me was the rhythm of it and just the dedication it took to do something like that. So um, MMA was starting to take, like, catch fire, especially yep. for women then. Like, Rhonda had just gotten signed and things. Um, and so I kept saying, guys, I'm going to do one fight. I'm going to do one fight. And everyone was like, no, don't do that. Your face, all this stuff. I'm like, you guys <laughs> realize I'm not fighting Mike Tyson? Like, yeah. it'll be fine. It's going to be okay. And they're like, no, 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 no. So I uh, – I went through one bad boyfriend and then I went in and st like took a trial and started training and loved it. 
And then was just like, oh, I can't afford this. It wasn't a career idea yet. It was like, oh, right. I love that, but maybe later. So then went through another bad breakup. And the story goes that, so, <laughs> so I did that thing that you do when you go through a breakup where you eat, like, a lot of donuts and you drink too much beer and you wake up on your buddy's floor after you played video games all night. That's like a Tuesday and, uh, for me. Yeah, well, that's what I do when I go through a breakup. <laughs> so I wake up, and um, and I he lived in this shit house apartment, and like I wake up and there's a crack in his door, but the sun's coming through. It's like hitting me in the face. And for me and how I believe that was like God saying, "Wake up! I gotta tell you something. Get up off the floor, dust yourself off. Like you're made for more than this. Like quit being a jerk." All right, and I thought okay, I need to take myself out tonight. I need to clean up, shave my legs, and, like, go out, you know? Like, I don't care if I need anybody or anything. I just need to go do this for myself. Yeah, you got to so go. Just you that. can't just sit stagnant. Yeah. yeah. So I went to work that day, thinking, like, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And on my way into work, I worked at a, at a boot store right on Broadway in Nashville, and there was this uh, sports bar right next door to us, and they had a big poster that day that said UFC 190, uh, Rousey versus Kohea. And I really didn't know much about Rhonda. Like, I knew who she... That's not it. I knew who she was, <laughs> but I didn't really know. I really kind of didn't. I could barely recognize her, you know? Right. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go somewhere and watch that fight. That sounds like a good time. And um, so I did. I went out that night. I ended up at a, like, a Hooters. And they are like... Hey, there's nowhere for you to sit. I'm like, I just called. They said there was. Like, oh, actually, there's this table of uh, of ladies that said somebody could come and sit with them if they didn't like if they didn't have a place. I'm like, right. yeah, I don't care. That's fine. Excuse me. So I wind up at this table of random women. They're like in their late 30s, 40s, and I'm 25 at the time, and we're all drinking. And they're like, man, don't you wish you could still train for something like this? And I'm like, huh, I could, you know? <laughs> and then the card was good. Claudia Gadelia had a really good fight, and that amped me up. But then Rhonda came out and just, like, Obliterated. blew that sh away. Yeah. And there was something so powerful about that to me. And I and it just hit me like a, a freaking comet. And I was like, that. I'm going to do that. That's it. And there was, there was no question. I could just feel it in my bones. And so I got super excited that night, really passionate, signed up for the gym right away, started jujitsu, fell in love, and then got a chance to go back to my home state, train wrestling at my high school, which I wasn't on the wrestling team when I went there, but it was cool getting to come back. And yeah, it's all gone from there. It's been a rabbit hole of this gym, that gym, this training partner, whatever. But that's kind of like the... That was the beginning of it all. Well, and you think, like you said, you've been training for three years now? Uh, three and a half, yeah. It doesn't sound long when you put it out there and you yeah. know, this guy's been training for 20 years. This guy's been training yeah. all his life. Three so years is a long people. freaking time. A long it is, time. It is and it isn't, right? It, it is in that you were right to say, like, every day we are getting it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. the day runs something like this. You get up about 7 a.m., you get all your, you eat your breakfast and stuff like that. Um, then depending on what your schedule's like, I might go for a couple mile run. Then I'm going to go to striking. Um, there might be a bit of a break and I work some hours. Then I'm going to jujitsu for like three plus hours or some kind of grappling. So you're in the gym anywhere from like four to six hours. And if you're not getting that in, um, you feel like you're not accomplishing anything yeah, after a while. Right. Like it seems to be very, you know, it gets to be a very normal grind for sure yeah uh queen's army's got a question for you if you can name only one or two who was the biggest influencer who convinced you that you could fight uh myself and jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> um, uh as far as people though in the gym that have been a big help or a big influence uh i would say andrea kgb lee and um and jessica rose clark jesse jess they shout were, out to um, andrea lee and jesse jess yeah. <laughs> Andrea was a uh, early on training partner for me and was one of the first people who kind of like took me aside and started showing me the ropes, you know? Um, and then Jesse has just taken that role now um, and helped me grow exponentially from the time we met until, until now. And it's, 
I just can't be more grateful for people. And there's been other people, like when I lived with Shayna Baszler and Jessamyn Duke, they were really helpful. They explained a lot of things, a lot of like mentalities or pitfalls to me um, that have helped me avoid situations or heal from situations or what right. have you. So they were huge, huge for me too. I've had a really pedigreed, influential journey. <laughs> <laughs> like really I have. I've, been, I've gotten to work with so many OGs and legends and stuff that I, I don't feel – I don't even know how that happened, but I, I'm grateful. <laughs> well, I mean, when you talk about somebody like Shayna Baszler, I mean, she's been doing this for a long time. Like the amount of information that she has and that she's mm -hmm. transferred over to her wrestling career now – I mean, yeah. she's, she's not going to display all of it in, in one match or, you know, one month. Like, this, this is just beginning for her, you know what I mean? And to be able to tap her book a secret, so to speak, I mean, that had to put you miles ahead. Yeah, you know, I just in, I don't know, there's some, so it's hard not to have imposter syndrome when you start something like this, especially right. in your mid-20s, like, it used to really mess with me thinking like, man, I did this too late. I'm, I don't know if I have time to get to where I want to go kind of a thing. Um, but when you get a chance to be not only like accepted by somebody like that, but have them go like, hey, you're one of the hardest workers I've seen. If you just keep grinding, I don't see why you can't be successful. You that's know? huge. Stuff like that. Like that's a big feather in your cap, you know, and when you're having a bad day, you think about what they said to you or you – hear them say things like listen it wasn't that many years ago that I was exactly where you're at you know and right like somebody like Jesse really like we've ran a very similar course and to see how successful she is now and how skilled she is now I'm like all right just keep doing this and you're gonna see the same fruit you know like in a few years your life's gonna be so much different right and I mean, it has to be from, I mean, what, four years ago doing the music thing to, yeah. I mean, now you've been to, you're in California for a bit at the gym there. Now you're at 10th Planet in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you're doing the damn thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> there, every once in a while, like it, it just becomes so routine that you kind of don't think about it. But every once in a while, a dose of like straight reality hits me when I'm at the PI on camera with Jesse and we're preparing for my fight in tough enough, which is where so many legends have gotten their start. Right. And I'm like, that's the thought, like you're really doing this. Like this <laughs> is for like, it doesn't get any more pinnacle. Like you're doing it. So just keep going. You know, it's kind of almost like when, like you said earlier, when you step into that cage is it's almost like an out of body experience. Like you almost have to stop yourself and look around and go, oh, Holy shit. Like I'm doing yeah. this. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's why, like, uh, for those of you that follow me on Twitter, I've been slacking lately, but I usually do my grateful posts. It's three things I'm grateful for throughout the day. And it can be something as simple as eggs or headphones all the way out to like, you know, this person really helped me fix my bubble, or whatever. It's always a bunch of different stuff, but that's why I do that because I realize I live a very privileged life. Um, you know, everything's not perfect. I don't think anyone's life is, right. but like damn like yeah it's cool it's living the dream for real like really there's nothing else i'd want to be doing and taking a week off is a bittersweet thing because your body's tired and and your body's your business so you've got to protect yeah. it and everything but like i love it so much i want to be doing it but now i'm lethargic because of all this food it's, just like, <laughs> it's a mess but it's hard and i think if you can find that thing that that you like yearn for if you take a week off then you're that's your thing you know how much in a regular training week, like, so let's say you don't have a fight coming up. You're just doing your regular training four to six hours a day. How many days off do you take from training? Are you just in there daily? It's like, like a day and a half ish. Um, so usually my training will run like that full time stuff Monday through Friday. Saturday will be like a simple, more of like a conditioning workout. That's only like an hour or so. Um, and then, and then I may go do something fun, like go on a hike, you know, right. um, just to stay active because I enjoy doing stuff like that. But, uh, and then Sunday I'll be off or maybe Saturday's off and then Sunday we'll go to like an open mat and grab like eight to 10 rolls. But, um, yeah, it's pretty much all the time. And you take one full day or one three quarter day off because that is your training, you know, like right. you have to look at it that way. I used to struggle with that some, even though I was like, 
insanely t- in fact Shane and Jess were were integral and in like kind of starting to help me grasp what recovery was for and that it wasn't for babies like it yeah. was <laughs> yeah. super important you know um I think some people milk it for sure but I knew that I was kind of I, I felt behind the curve, you know, because yeah. I'd started late. I didn't wrestle in school. And so I just went in both feet, both hands and my head, like, boom, like a thousand miles an hour. And when I was living with them. I was working overnight. So I thought, oh, that'll be great. I'll get up and I'll train team practice. And then, you know, I can like sleep middle of the day, maybe get like some other stuff in and I'll go to work. It'll be great. Well, that's not what happened. <laughs> I would... <laughs> Go to work at 11, get off at 7, sometimes couldn't wind down because I was on so much caffeine to stay awake. Right. Like t- like two monsters and a coffee towards the end, which is super Yeesh. unhealthy and not like me, but that's what I was doing. <laughs> and still falling asleep at work. Don't tell my boss. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, nobody watches this anyway. <laughs> I used to go, so side note, there was an IHOP like a block away. I used to go down there and I'd have my radio and I'd just turn it up really loud and put it like right here and sleep in the boots that I had. <laughs> I couldn't make it through the night. So I would go, anyway, I'd go train, I'd get, or I'd go to work, get off about 7 a.m., get home by 7.30, couldn't wind down. Yeah. Uh, we had practice at like 10 a.m. And I'd come in, sometimes it was a sparring day and it was just ruthless. Like I remember my heart just racing out of my chest because I was so tired and so jacked up on Mountain Dew <laughs> and just couldn't, it couldn't hang. It was rough. And then trying to go to sleep after that, probably couldn't and then I'd go to like a wrestling practice or jujitsu it was just constant like trying to train two three times a day and work a full-time job at night was not conducive to being healthy and yeah there's no way your body's gonna be able to keep up with that no matter what they age kept, you were. They, they kept telling me like you can't hang with this pace and I was like watch me yeah and and I kept I kept at it but it was definitely it hit a point where I was like okay enough's enough like I gotta find a better way to do this and Luckily, I had some opportunities pop up after that 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 helped me. <laughs> like Shana used to work a similar situation. She had to work like nights at UPS or whatever, yeah. and was still training two three times a day. And so she understood. She goes, "Listen, you're not going to know how bad you really feel right now until you're done with it." And as soon as I got done with it, and like a week or two went by, I was like, "Whoa! <laughs> like, <laughs> how was I even doing anything? I felt horrible." Yeah. So, I've got. Uh, actually, the chat's been great today. They've been tossing a ton of messages up for you. Oh, uh, Whit Cranford says, tell Chelsea she better not stop now or I'll beat her up. <laughs> and then everybody's that. putting money on Whit Cranford. So there's yeah. that. I don't know if you want to go around <laughs> finding people in the chat room and smack them around. But it's oh, funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, Queen's Army wants to know how awesome was it to go to the UFC Performance Institute? Oh, it, it's awesome. Like it's a state of the art, beautiful facility. Everyone's super nice. Um, I, I get to go there usually once a week. Um, Jesse does like, uh, sprint Saturdays. So, um, she brought me in, I guess that would have been back when she was training for Jessica. I over the summer. Yep. And, uh, so I usually come in every week and we push each other in there and, um, yeah, it's awesome. I, I just can't, it's, you know, I think it does something for your for your head a little bit too to know that not only can my corner beat up their corner, but I'm getting a chance to go in, into these facilities and and just rub shoulders with the best of the best. It kind of just makes you feel, I don't know, it makes you feel like a champion, you know. Yeah, you're, for you're sure. In, you're you're in the spot already. You can see it and yep. feel it, and you know, it doesn't make me special. I still have to put in all the work, but damn, is it a blessing to get a chance to be well, in like the mecca exactly it's kind of like that because even no matter what you do in life whether you're a carpenter or you're a fighter or it doesn't matter what you do it's always nice to see two things one is the reward and the second is the progress mm-hmm. you know what i mean yeah. like if you don't have yep. the reward like if you're not getting a paycheck then you feel like shit but you can also be getting a paycheck <laughs> see no reward and you're not going to feel great you know what i mean yeah, yeah. So you're getting that the best of both of those. I mean, you're getting the paycheck for fighting and stuff, but you're also getting that reward of seeing, oh shit, like here's progress. Like I'm at the, you know, the Performance Institute. Yeah. You know, I'm training with Jesse Jess. I'm doing all this shit. Like that's insane. Yeah, like you think about that girl in the bar that decided that she was gonna fight, and then I, I like, I could have a conversation with that person now, and we two totally different people you know like i 
I don't know. I mean, some things would obviously be the same, but I, I, what I'm trying to say is I think I've grown uh, just exponentially as a human being through this whole process. And oh, that's, for sure. That's part of what keeps me coming back for more. Like, I know people don't always understand, like, the brutality or what have you behind the sport of MMA, um, but what it's done for me as, a, as just a person, I, I wouldn't trade for anything ever, ever. Nope. Uh, so... <sighs> Pepper Sauce 9000, that's CM Pepper P, if you remember her. <laughs> yeah, uh, she so says, that's... Chelsea, you earned, earned in capital letters, uh, the life you were living. Privilege implies it was gifted to you. You work hard for it. Oh, man. I appreciate that. I just try to, I just don't ever want to come off ungrateful or give myself an out to be ungrateful. So that's why I talk that way. And and I do believe it's a privilege. Like, not, not everybody gets to do the things that I do. I realize that not every amateur fighter has had the privilege to, to rub shoulders and train alongside, you know, all the people that I have or right. get a chance to drink the water at the PI. Like it, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's just holy water. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's like Camp Anderson water. Silva sweat. That's all comes out yeah, of the fountains. That's there. actually what it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they said they're going to bring in the Chuck Bell variety. Looking forward to that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Queen's Army, and well, everybody I'm sure wants to know, uh, do you have any plans on your next fight? Um, no. Uh, they were really happy with how things went for me, the promotion was. Um, so I think I'm going to continue to be on their radar, but my camp wants to go ahead and kind of, you know, tighten some things up, which I'm okay with. Yep. Um, if, if I can continue to go back to the lab and improve exponentially and come out scarier and scarier with every fight, then I'm totally okay with that. Keep them guessing, you know, like if I don't, if, if I don't ever come out on the same level as I did before, that's going to be really hard to prepare for. So I'm okay with that. For sure. That's kind of the thing too, is I mean, and this is a horrible comparison because they're not even the two alike things, but like with this podcast, for instance, you know, I, I record the episode, I go back, I'll watch it. So episode one with, you know, Derek List and big stinky moose, Okay, I noticed I did this, this, this wrong. Uh, same yeah. thing with the Wit Cranford episode. By the way, Wit, still awesome episode. I've watched that like twice or three <laughs> times now. And that's almost a two-hour episode. But wow. there are always <laughs> things that you see. And, and you kind of, mm -hmm. and again, horrible comparison. I'm not getting punched in the face. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody walks in this room and smacks me in the face a few times while I'm doing the podcast, okay, I need <laughs> to do this so I don't get smacked in the face. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> but but you're right that way. I mean, Sometimes you need to take that break, go back, watch everything you did, talk to your coaches, polish that up. And then, like you said, the next time you come out, you can be even more scary and you just keep improving and improving and improving. And I mean, yeah. once you get five fights deep, like they're in deep shit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I, you know, I have some goals in mind and some promotions I'd like to fight for on my way up and some things that, you know, just things I want to accomplish. But, um, you know, some people, some people were very impressed, I guess, with the fight that I just had, which is humbling, but I know I can do better and I know I have to do better and be more dynamic if I want to move up and fight for say Invicta and then eventually the UFC and right. stuff like that. So it's, it's, um, I'm really hard on myself. Like even within the night, I was not happy with giving her 25 seconds of acknowledgement. Like right. I don't like, you know, and, and knowing that I could have lost that fight, um, you know, but I had to push those feelings out and just enjoy my win, enjoy what I had, what I'd, what I'd earned and, and be happy about it and be proud of it. And so I let myself do that. And then like two days ago, I watched the majority of the film and was like, All right, I'm over it. Like, <laughs> let's go back and fix it. I'm ready. Um, but, you know, I think that mentality will take me a long way. Huge. The, the mentality that, you know, you could put your ego aside. And not just say, I won, screw you, I did the right things, but to go back and be able to criticize yourself and improve really on what you see. I mean, it's like unhealthy, actually. I've been working on like <laughs> being more proud of myself, and I, and I am now. And that was one of the things that that win um, kind of put to bed for me was like, yeah, I, I truly am proud of myself for what I've accomplished, and it's okay to be that way, you know? And people used to give. I know we've talked about her a lot, but people used to give her on a really hard time for her for her attitude. One, yep. the, chick, the chick was selling a fight. Yeah. Okay? Like, that's one thing we need to recognize. Two, 
like she said, she's like, listen, it's taken me a long time to get to this point where I'm proud of myself and happy with myself. And I don't think that made very much sense to most people, myself included, because you're like, you're like a freaking superhero. Like, how could you not feel amazing? You're an Olympian, da, da, da. But uh, everyone goes through different stuff. And so I 100% can identify with that now and go, cool. Now I'm past that for myself. And now you have a responsibility, though, to not let your head get too big. I don't think hers did. I'm not a reference at her. But for me, like, it's easy because people start to come around and be like, you're amazing and you're this and you're that. And you have to go, thank you. Yep. (laughs) I'm going to go work on this, though, you know, and, and keep pushing yourself. You can't buy into... I've been trying to explain this to people. When I step into the cage, I think I can beat any creature on the planet. That has to be where your mindset's at. When you're outside of the cage, you need to be kissing babies and meaning it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yep. I call it the humble hustle. You got to be be a human being. You know, people are looking to you now because you just, not everyone can get in there and throw punches. So it is an amazing thing to some people to see that. But you don't want to come off like you think so. You know, no one's yeah, interested in that sure. guy. <laughs> but you're absolutely right, though. Is And what I won't say a lot of people, but it is a, a minority that can't separate the person from the fighter. You know what I mean? There's one person selling the fight. There's another person entirely that you're never going to see. That's their personal yeah. life. That's how they really are. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, Ronda Rousey isn't. She's selling a fight. Conor McGregor selling a fight. Colby Covington, they're trying to sell a fight. Yeah, yeah. Colby's trying to sell a fight that he can't even get. I mean. (laughs) (laughs) Poor guy. I know. Yeah. But there there definitely is that, that there needs to be that difference and people need to realize that difference that, hey, like, just because you see this person on this promo saying this thing about this person, they're doing that to get your money. They're not doing it because that's who they are. I mean, that's. If nobody's buying, they're not getting paid. The more people buy, the more they get paid. You'll catch it. Like in my promos and interviews, I'm very blunt. Like they ask me, I don't know where it is. I want to see it. But they were asking me a lot of goofy questions. They're like, so like this girl, what do you know about her? I'm like, she's a girl fighter. (laughs) <laughs> Again, then they're like, but but like, what's your game like? And I'm like, I don't know. And they go, well, what do you think she's going to try to do to you? And I was like, I don't care what she's going to try to do to me. I know what I'm going to do to her, and that's take care of her tonight. And they were like, oh. Oh, God. You know? It's just funny, but that's, I mean, I believe that, but it's, it's like As well as you should, right? You know? Yeah, in pro wrestling, they talk about it. It's just you turn to 11, and so a lot of fighters miss a chance to show their personality and have a good time and sell tickets because they're afraid to... To walk that line of maybe being a little bit of a heel but that's what i come from so i don't care <laughs> <laughs> well that's it like you do have to have confidence but like what you're seeing is kind of an overinflated version of yourself because you're selling the fight right that's all it is it's you on 11. <laughs> <laughs> uh the tex ferguson wants to know what was your <laughs> best post-fight cheat meal this week hmm it's hard to break it into meals because it's kind of just been like this uh, perpetual buffet. <laughs> um, I ate copious amounts of chocolate, like to the point where you'd be like, ew, like this isn't even good anymore and you're still eating it. And then three hours later you find more and you go, yeah, I want that. <laughs> um, but it's like an actual meal. Oh, no, I haven't eaten any, like, actual good food. It's been, like, Del Taco and pizza at 3 a.m., like, disgusting food. Tacos are awesome. That's got to be one of my oh. favorite foods. Tacos and hot dogs. Ooh. What? I went and had... <laughs> hot dogs are not even food. Hot dogs are sauerkraut <laughs> and ketchup. Dude. Really? <laughs> Dude, really, yeah. If I was no. a fighter, that's literally... <laughs> I would have a tray of 12 hot dogs with sauerkraut and ketchup waiting for me the second i stepped out of the cage win or lose i don't care no oh man (laughs) you know what's good two things one last night so there's a place called pinche's tacos here in um, vegas and i don't even like tacos i'm a burrito fan right but their tacos are so good so i actually did cruise over there last night that was the best like real food i've had in a while um and then oh The brown butter chocolate chip cookies from Whole Foods are (laughs) insane. I've had like four of those within a week, and I ate like three of them between weigh-ins and fighting. (laughs) Oh, jeez. Yeah, it was a problem. Uh, Your mom says she's super proud of you the way you're growing. 
Oh, thanks, mom. Your mom seems trying like a real to live my best life. <laughs> yeah, she uh, she's like, she's good for cooking for everyone. That's for sure. Ty Five wants to know how your cauliflower ear is coming along. Dude, it's pretty cool. Can you <laughs> see it? Is that? It's, is that my ear? Yeah, there's not so bad. I mean, you can still put oh, an earplug in there. Yeah, but it's like, it's pretty gnarly. And the <laughs> other one is wanting to join the pack so yeah i'm gonna look <laughs> like the real deal forever now <laughs> see i've always said like you've got to be a certain breed to be a fighter like nobody likes getting punched in the face and guaranteed yeah. like you train so that you don't get punched in the face really but it's gonna mm -hmm. happen i mm -hmm. mean i've watched videos of mma fighters and, and all of them do it when they start getting the cauliflower ear they just jam a needle in their ear and try and drain it that way by themselves that is mm -hmm. crazy I can't do it by myself. I'm really squeamish about blood and like, I can take needles. I don't mind. Like I'll even watch while they um, draw my blood or whatever, but something about me doing it to myself creeps me out. And so when this was blowing up, I had to have some other people do it for me. And Oof. that kind of made it worse in a way because I wasn't getting it drained very often. And so it was just hard. It was a process, but I'm proud of my ear. Like I wanted my ear forever um and when i very very first started i was like gross i don't want that i don't want to look <laughs> ugly and then i was like yeah yeah i do because it's a badge of honor and exactly like, i want people to know i do this you know and when i'm old i'm gonna be weird looking anyway so i might as well have my grandkids be like grandma what's with your ears and me be like grandma was a badass <laughs> you know like grandma I get to kicks tell that, that ass <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so you mentioned that your coach is uh, Jessica Rose Clark. Uh, she's got a fight coming up on May 22nd, I believe, UFC 237 in Rio de Janeiro. Does that, that sound familiar? I thought it was May oh, 11th. Oh, May 11th. You're right, yeah. you're right. You're right. May 11th. Do you, yep. like, does she keep you on to, just as a training partner the entire time? Or does she kind of, like, train with you, train with others, train with whatever? So uh, this go-around might be different, um, but... Since the I fight, which was June of last year, yep, uh, I've been I've been pretty much on the hook for uh, a punching bag. <laughs> um, but it's taught me a lot. And, and I'll tell you this: when you have somebody who's fought at flyweight but was a is a true bantamweight, right? Um, that hits like a dude, <laughs> um, piece you up day after day after day after day. You learn that you're really durable and that it'd be very unlikely for anyone as a straw weight in my weight class to be able to put that pressure or that, that amount of power on me. So it does something for your confidence where you're like, I've seen the storm man. I've been in the war, <laughs> like we're fine, but, but yeah, she keeps me around. I don't know if we'll work together as much for this fight. Um, because she, she and I have moved over to extreme couture. And so there's a lot more girls with a lot more experience and size than me, right? which is going to be an important factor as she fights these larger, more experienced girls. So, um, you know, we live together as well. So I hold down the fort. Um, you know, we just, we're a good team, like whatever one needs, we just make sure it happens. So if it's not going to be me training this go around and it's just up to me to keep things in line around here, then cool, you know, but, um, Man, I'm excited for that fight, and I'm excited <laughs> for her to come back as a as a big old bantamweight. She's, woo, she's nasty. <laughs> no, she's. I did watch her fight against Paige Van Zant, and that's the one that opened my eyes. Like, holy shit! <laughs> you know what I and mean? That was like that was a crazy fight too, because so I had we had just started training together like a week or less before the Beck fight, which was her UFC debut, right? Yep. And then right away she gets this fight with Paige, and everyone in the gym is excited, you know, because, like, on paper she's, like, the anti-Paige. She's this dark-haired, tattooed, like, mohawk chick, and everyone's yep. like, oh, this is going to be cool. And um, she had had, like, I want to say five fights in 13 months or something, and that nice. was the fifth one. And then... Um, most people, I think, know the story that her uh, her house had gotten broken into and the cat was killed right before the fight. Yeah. And so her body, after that much weight cutting that close together, was just shutting down. Yeah. And then the stress of all the personal stuff. So um, to have sparred her many times before that fight, know what she's capable of, and to see her go out, and it was like, oh, man, she's winning and doing great, but this isn't even as scary as she gets. And, 
I know that after that performance, she said it wasn't her favorite, you know? And so yeah. if that, if that made a fan out of, out of anybody, I can't wait for everyone to see her healthy and a hundred percent, you know? That's the thing. It's especially with like combat sports. I mean, your mentality <clears throat> just going into the thing has to be a hundred percent. Like if you're not believing that you're a complete badass when you step into that cage, you pretty much lost at that point. A hundred percent. And that's, that's why you see people. So last night people, we were all kind of surprised at Woodley's performance. And, you know, for somebody to hold a belt like that for so long, you have to know that like last night was just completely an off night. Oh, or yeah. maybe there's a factor going on that we have no idea about. So I, I really, I really don't like to hear people giving somebody like that a super hard time because you don't know what it's like to be him at all. And, exactly. um, you know, he's got to be beside himself that he lost his belt. It's, it's, you work so hard to get there and then defend it and you're the greatest and then you're not. And now everyone wants to take a big crap on you because of that. And it's like, you know, if anyone else has a bad day at work, it's usually just like, you had a bad day at work. Exactly. You know? It's not exactly. what he went through last night. He's still having a bad day. It's a lot, you know, and, um, so well, it's not know. like he wasn't, you know, he was training. He was doing the right things. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't eating tiramisu the night before. I mean, and he, he fully expected to win. He did. He expected yeah. to get out there and win. So, um, what I'll say on the flip side of that is you watch John Jones beat Anthony Smith and Smith came out and looked great. Like oh, that yeah. first, that first round was pretty much 50, 50. You could make a case for either guy. Um, something happened, I would say, midway through the second or into the third, where Smith bought into Jones' hype. Yep. That's what I saw happen. 100%. And so he started letting him bully him and stuff like that. And that's – people were kind of asking, like, what's going on? What's going on? I said Smith bought into the mysticism, and that's yep. what you, you'll you see happen. Like, you know, with McGregor when he was coming up so hot and heavy, you would see people that technically should beat him maybe because yep. they're better at this or that. But they would start to buy into the like Aldo really bought into that. He was still oh, yeah. coming out there, and he got hammered for it. And you know, it's it, none of it's easy. But uh, but yeah, that's what I see happen. Is sometimes that's it's just the X factor of whatever that athlete has accomplished. It's not even their skill set that really puts people down. It's interesting. It's it's funny you mentioned that Anthony Smith thing. Like I was watching last night, and like same thing. I thought like as soon as mm -hmm. Jones hit him with a couple of weird. You know, yeah, flaily weird. strikes. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, you go, "Holy crap!" Don't get me wrong. If I get a spinning elbow to the head, I'm tapping out. Oh, yeah. I don't care. I'm not a fighter. Like, game over. <laughs> John Jones, this no is more yours. Of that. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> hit me with the jab. Hit me with whatever I want. But when you start spinning, I'm out. But you feel spinning so bad over. for the guy because I mean, uh, with Smith, mm -hmm. I mean, this is huge fight for him. This wasn't a tomato can fight. Like Smith can fight. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. know that he could he could win that if he didn't keep like you said if he almost didn't feed into that hype and was the yeah. first to every punch. I mean, who's done that to John Jones? Nobody really. Yeah, I mean he stood toe to toe. It looked it was great. Oh yeah, like that was cool to watch. You know, the only um, you know Alexander Gustafson has has stood toe to toe. And, you know, that was ex not this last fight, but their first meeting yeah. was great like that. You know, him and uh, DC obviously have had some good good battles that, yeah. you know. But, yeah, I thought it was really impressive, but it was weird to watch. Like, it almost looked like this wave came over him where he was like, I don't have it. Yeah. You know, and... The, you you the, feel the, so bad for a guy in that position, too, because it's like he's in quicksand at that point. Yeah, and his, um, his corner, I thought, was saying the right stuff and the oh, right yeah. stuff that should have fired him up, but... Well, people don't understand, and it, it happened to it happened with Woodley, like he was saying, where there it kind of happened to me in my first fight, where you're waiting for something specific to happen. You've drilled everything very perfect and precise in practice, so if you don't see the the right flash card, so to speak, pop up, yep. then you don't think that you're supposed to do X, Y, or Z. And in reality, what I learned through this camp going into this fight was like it's going to be chaotic. And you got to keep working to find the win, basically. Like, and things aren't ever going to go as planned, ever, ever, ever. So don't get married yeah. to that idea. You can, like, if you end up out of position or you end up in a bad position, then it's just thinking about getting to a good position. And then it's back to offense. It's back to finding the win. But it's, it's, um, it's across all levels, though. You saw the best of the best last night struggle with getting going. Yeah. And that's a very real concept. 
and everyone thinks it's real easy <laughs> until you get in there and it's it's not. You can have the best camp, eat all the right food, best weight cut, whatever, and then you come out one night and it's just like you're not home. That's the you're only flat, way I can describe yeah. it. You're flat, yeah. And it's it's another thing too is like I've, you know I've read a little bit on Twitter of people like talking about John Jones saying and Tim saying it right now that John Jones sort of got disqualified. Da da da. There's not a real fighter in the world that would take a win like that when he Thank threw that accident. I'll say accidental knee, but it, it wasn't accidental. But he, it's the second one he threw in exactly. section, so I don't think it was an accident. <laughs> but there's not a fighter in the world. And could you imagine if Smith would have been like, "Yeah, I can't continue." Gets the belt by like, a de- <laughs> come on. Yeah. I Nobody's know, paying I mean, extra money to watch that guy fight with the title if he did it that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, what a joke, right? Like he'd be the laughing stock of the company. You can't you just can't do that. So many so I was at a at a party with a bunch of people and all these guys were um most of these guys are straight jujitsu guys, so they don't know what it's like to get hit in the face or get hit in the face in front of a thousand people or more. Um and so they were like, Man, you should have taken that DQ, like making fun of him and I'm like No. I can't even believe, like, the competitor inside me was pissed they'd even make a joke like that. Yeah. Like, that's the biggest wussy tap-out thing I've ever heard anyone say. Like, no way. Even if I was, like, shellacked and couldn't ring, like, just couldn't even ring my own bell, I'd be like, I'm still going. Because <laughs> you're going to have to kill me, pretty much. To Like, you want your belt? Okay, then put me on the canvas. But yeah. I'm not going to come out here and say, sure, I'll quit for the belt. <laughs> like... And there, there's no, and that's like we talked about earlier. I mean, you train your ass off and you're not like, this isn't a hobby. Like this is a job. You train your ass off. And there's a certain amount of pride that goes with that. I mean, 100%. if you, yeah. if someone was to ever go that route and take the easy way out and take a title, there's no reward in that. Like you didn't no. beat that other person. They beat themselves essentially. Yeah. And you're going to, um, then there's the whole immediate rematch situation and then the whole exactly. division's mad at you because blah 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 it's just yeah no way <laughs> you know <laughs> but um i don't buy a lot of things that jones says but what i did think he was serious about last night was that he wasn't real stoked on his performance and i think he was truly being humble when he said like you know what i'm gonna go back to the lab and try to get better and yep. that was cool to hear him say because you know, he's dubbed as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, that the sport has ever seen. Oh, definitely. Um, and he did put on a good show, and he beat the dump out of that guy in oh, the yeah. fourth round. I mean, the fact that he survived that round does say a lot about Anthony. I mean, he got his ass kicked. Kicked. Like, oh, yeah. on the street, most people would have just balled, like, balled up and ran away somehow, something. But he took it. I mean, to get knees and the ribs like that is insane. Oh, yeah. Those were well, no bueno. You can hear it through the TV just thumping, you know? Yeah. And yeah, so that was cool. I'm, I'm you know, you want to see somebody come full circle and actually be a good person. <laughs> oh, for sure. And that's the problem with John Jones, too, right? Is he, when he first came in the UFC, he had that squeaky clean, like, almost a Captain America image. You know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. everything he did was like take your vitamin say your prayers kind of bullshit that like Hulk Hogan would do. And then he crashes Mercedes into, into a light post or a tree or whatever. And everybody yeah. kind of went, huh? Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Coke running over pregnant women and stuff. Exactly. And then all this other bad shit happens. <laughs> and now he comes back out. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's like, he's still trying to portray that good guy image, but you know, deep down you're kind of like, John, come on, <laughs> you know? I just don't buy it because it's so over the top. Like, yeah, I hope that that's the truth and that he's different and stuff just for like more for the face of the sport, you know, like you're supposed to be one of our poster children and you're really kind of giving us a black eye and I don't appreciate that, yeah. you know, like uh, I'm always trying to do things to, cause there's still a lot of casuals or fringe fans or non fans even that just don't understand. And then when they read a headline like that, it's like, we just missed a whole audience and this whole thing is actually really powerful and can help a lot of people and change a lot of lives yep. even on a casual level um and no one's perfect so it's like all right man you wrecked your car cool but then to get off the hook and off the hook and off the hook and off the hook i'm like where do we draw the line you know yeah. what i mean where do we draw the line that's all i I'm think saying. with john jones there is a bunch of truth in what he says but i mean everybody's got that friend who's like a really good friend really good person but cannot stop fucking up for the saves of their life. You know what I mean? Like, 
it's because they're not held accountable. Like, yeah. there's never really a result for him. It's like, wow, that's crazy, Kay. Let's just go over to Vegas and fight instead. <laughs> that was nuts. Changing or an entire card California. location for that. Yeah. was it's just, I, I still can't believe that. Yeah, no one else. That's crazy. Exactly. There's not, maybe outside of Conor McGregor. Yeah, McGregor. Maybe. But he's got his issues too. <laughs> Oh, what did you think about the Cody Garbrandt fight? Man, like, so I was, I was gutted for Cody, you know, um, I met him when he was going through like his hot streak of coming up right before he became champion. And he was a really nice, really humble guy. Um, and I feel like he's come from a pretty humble beginning. So it's always cool to see somebody like that be so successful and, be a good influence on a young kid like Maddox and all that. And, yeah, um, that was huge. Yeah, you know, and then he went through his loss with TJ, which that could have been either guy. They yeah. were coming oh, out yeah. to kill each other, you know what I mean? And it ended up being Cody went down. And um, so that was a bummer to watch. And then I thought, all right, Cody's a champ. He's going to get back on his horse and come back out here and show out. And he didn't, so that was sad, but only thing I can say is I feel like he's been fighting a little emotional. Yeah. Um, and that'll get you every time. And so I'm hoping that he can go back to the drawing board and solve whatever that is for him and, and come back out and start getting, you know, some wins together. Cause I think he's super talented and oh, yeah. I thought he was, thought he was a good representative as a champion for the sport. I liked him as champion. Big time. Big time. Yeah. I think, uh, like watching back like the Dominic Cruz fight. I mean, <laughs> Nobody does that to Dominic Cruz. That was heartbreaking because Dom was probably the fighter I was a fan of way, way back. Like the first person I was a fan of. And when I got into this, I reached out to him on Twitter just asking like industry questions. I asked him something like, um, like, what do you, what's the mindset or what does it take to be a champion? Or like, what, what are your thoughts? Like, what's your yeah. short answer for that? And he said, um, he said, don't listen to the opinions of other people because the mentality is something that most people won't understand. And that stuck with me forever. Um, yep. So that was cool. So yeah, huge fan of Dom. And I think like every time I listen to him commentate, I learned something. Um, so that was insane. That was just like wrong. <laughs> it's like how is he just not only beating him, but like tooling him, making yeah. fun oh, of yeah. him mid round. I'm like, no one does this to Dominic <laughs> Cruz. And Dom didn't even come out. He wasn't flat. No, he just wasn't all. keeping up that night. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> you know, yeah. you kind of with Dominic Cruz. I mean, you kind of wonder how much his body can keep doing this. Like he's very in, uh, injury prone, but yeah. like what he shows up when he's supposed to show up and he does his best. And like, like you said, like watching against, against uh, Cody Garbrandt, like same thing. I remember just sitting there watching it and I couldn't even blink. Like how the fuck is this happening? Yeah, it was unbelievable. I'm glad I got to witness it because I feel like it was such a moment in history for the oh, yeah. sport. But I was just so heartbroken about it. Like, no, <laughs> he's the greatest. No. <laughs> and you're right yeah. about the uh, the Garbrandt and Dillashaw fights. I think if they fight a hundred times, that's pretty much a fifty fifty fight. Yeah. Yes. You know, and it's like clear. One of my favorite things, and I'll get into like another point about this. One of my favorite things about martial arts is that there's lineage, right? So yeah. you can always tell what camp someone's come out of or what camp someone spent a lot of time in by movement and like parts of their game that are strong. Yeah. And so it's very clear that they came up through the same gym. You know, it's like there's oh, things yeah. that are mirror mirror image, um, which is really fun to see them to see them fight of course how is my phone dying when it's ah. <laughs> the beauty iphone problems so i'll get into a further um like lineage thing for me so i got a chance to go to australia to train during this camp which was awesome and That'd australia cool. gorgeous so cool people are great <laughs> food's awesome beaches are what you would think they should be like if you've ever been to a california beach multiply that by 10 that's an australian beach um, it was just great. And so I'm out there, excuse me, and I'm getting to go to these gyms that Jesse used to train out of when she was still training in Australia and working with some of her former coaches. And it's a trip to see somebody instructing and moving just like 
your instructor. And I'm like, that's where you got that footwork. That's where you got that setup. That's like super cool. So it was neat to see like my upline almost because, you know, I've been her little project yep. and then, you know, these were her coaches. So that was one of the coolest things I've gotten to see and be a part of is like, wow, this is like really trickling down, you know? <laughs> So do you see that, like, where does a guy like Dominic Cruz come in then, who's probably trained with hundreds of other training partners, but has a style that's just 100% Dominic Cruz? Man, so that's not 100% true, because I feel like he's borrowed things from maybe people he hasn't trained under, just like Ali, and, like, he, right. he, he borrowed a lot of stuff from, like, old school boxing that a lot of us have forgotten about or never cared to study. Um, and he, he has made it his own thing, but I think that's what he went in and did. And listening to him talk on Rogan's cast a long time ago, like after he lost to Cody is one of my favorite interviews he gave, he really opened up and he talked a lot about how he, he struggled with inner demons and things like that too. Yep. And how, um, for him, it was a relationship with God and counseling and things that like really brought him past all that stuff and how he realized he didn't have to have a UFC belt to be a worthy person. So all that was really cool. And it was really neat to hear somebody that you think is a superhero be really vulnerable. Yeah. Um, that was cool. But yeah, the dude's just a study master. I, I wish, so I trained with him for a very, very short time when I was going through San Diego and, um, man, I don't know, just some people can see the game, um, much better than others. Like it's almost right. like they have a, a snow globe and they can just see all the parts of it. Um, cause that dude is just like, I don't know. He's, a, he's amazing. <laughs> I would, I wish I had more access to him still because he's somebody where you can think of the most random thing ever yep. and he can dissect it and go, this will work because of this. That won't work. Hey, do you like to wrestle? Okay. Then I would choose this path. Like he understands how to put all the pieces together. He's like an MMA engineer. He's amazing. So, I hope that he gets into coaching in some capacity after this and that I can work with him in the future. Like that's one thing I'm kind of excited about is, is as I'm coming up, some of these people are going to be retired and in a different, um, just a different point in their life. Yep. And maybe I'll get to pick their brain and train with them more than, than I did when they were training. Like that would be really cool, but there's so much knowledge to be gleaned from some of these people. <laughs> so I'm like, are you done fighting yet? Cause I really want to <laughs> talk to you. you know? Yeah. I think everybody was asking, uh, Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell after, after their last fight, you guys fucking done yet. Um, For real. <laughs> wasn't that disappointing? That was... Well, I don't know. Here's my thing. Like I have, one school of thought is this, and I always use Brett Favre as my example, like phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal quarterback, one of the best of all time. Yep. And then he decided to come back like three different times and it was like worse and worse as time went on and then gets caught in a scandal. And it's like, don't be, don't Brett Favre yourself. Like if you're like, I don't know, it's gotta be hard because it's always like, when's enough enough? Like I'm sure Brady is thinking this right now, like dude, ah, I'm way on top, but could I get one more, yep. you know? It's always going to be that, and I don't know. But Bellator, like a lot of the Bellator guys and stuff that were really popular, you know, 15 years ago that are still trying to fight, it's – I don't want to see them lose like that. Yeah. You know, like I want to remember them as superheroes. So Exactly. You know, not, I don't know. I have a hard time with it sometimes because it's like – I don't know. I just don't want to see them – look average <laughs> no you're absolutely right and that's and i wouldn't even want to see a, a fighter win that way like watching tito beat chuck i mean yeah chuck getting knocked out like that stop you know what i mean like yeah. i was watching him in stop. His, i was <laughs> yeah. watching uh that's they had like it's their pre-youtube stuff that they do before the fight it's almost like the the bellator's version of embedded or sorry not bellator uh that was with uh, uh, oscar de la hoya uh, Golden Boy, yeah? Yeah, Golden, Golden Boy Promotions. Boy. Yeah, yeah. And I was watching Chuck Liddell hitting pads. And I remember saying to myself, like, either A, he knows Tito's watching, so he's plugging it on purpose, and he's just sandbagging it. B, mm. he's actually trying his hardest to scare Tito. And it's like he's, you know, he's got hands made out of, like, anvils. Like, he just was not moving. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm concerned a little bit about some of those guys that have done it so long, like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I don't know. He didn't look healthy. That's all. No, 
he didn't look healthy. That fight should have never happened in the first place. No. Like it should have been sanctioned. But no, exactly. Like how did he pass the physical? Exactly. They didn't give him one. <laughs> but then that's on Oscar De La Hoya too. I mean, yeah. That and don't get me wrong. Like, I don't know the guy. I don't know much about the guy. Just from what you hear on news and YouTube and stuff. But in my in my view, he completely took advantage of the names. He didn't even know anybody else fighting on the card at the press conferences. He's like, here's Chuck, here's Tito, and uh, the rest of these guys. What are you doing? What? Yeah, Todd it was Waller insane. was there fighting, and he fought uh, at the highest level, you know? It's just, That's... Yeah, I'm not <laughs> a fan of Golden Boy. Oh, uh, boy. Got a question from JJK, Jessa June Kim. She says, what did you think about Tisha Torres and Whaley? Oh, man, I honestly missed that fight. Um, so I don't, I don't have an opinion. But what I will say, uh, I've been kind of catching up since it happened and yep. um it's really cool to see them be such amazing sports to one another like that's such a cool thing when when fighters just trade so much respect for one another oh yeah totally that's kind of what i like to see at the end of the fights so, like yeah sell the fight whatever you need to say whatever you need to do to get people watching but at the end of the day like two people just went to work and it's not yeah. a fluff job like this is a hard no. damn job that both people work yeah. their asses off for like put the beef aside yeah I know what goes into it, you know, even, even as like a, a teammate fan, you know, like when your teammate wins, I don't throw tomatoes on the person who they beat, you know, you're yeah. like, if you see them in the hallway, you shake their hand too, because they showed up and they made weight and they helped your friend put on a show. I mean, exactly. That's, without them, you have no dance to dance. So exactly. you better be grateful for them on something. Like that's your happy. paycheck. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Queen's Army wants to know, what would be your dream fight? Oh, man. There are some chicks in my division right now um, that I hope are still around when I get up there. Um, Claudia Gadelli is a fight I'd really like to take at some point. She's awesome. Yeah, she, she is a hell good. of a fighter. Yeah. yeah what about uh, Paige Van Zandt? What's your thought on that? Like, she's broken her arm again. Really? Yeah. She just uh, sent out a tweet, I think it was a couple days ago, saying that In the that Rachel she's... fight, she broke it? Yeah. It must have been in the fight or either in training shortly after the fight. Really? But yeah, she sent out a tweet saying my arm is broken again. Well, crap. Like, <laughs> that sucks. Paige uh, has always been really tough, you know? Like, I'm sorry, Jesse. I know what that feels like. So clearly she's a pretty tough girl. Oh, yeah. Um, she's also originally from Oregon. So I would, I'd like to fight her for sure. I think that'd be cool. Uh, Whit Cranford says, I want to train with Chelsea. Let's do it. <laughs> be awesome. Gotta love wit. Uh, so what else do we got here? Oh, uh, Dink. Uh, Alan Dinkinson actually sent a message earlier, and I think you would have saw the tweet. Uh, ask her about this great wrestling show she's going to. The main event features Filthy Tom Lawler and Josh Barnett. Yes. Uh, so there's going to be a pro wrestling show in town. It's going to be really good. There's a bunch of people on it, including uh, Tom Lawler and uh, Josh Barnett. He's got... Eli Everfly, um, I'm blanking on all the other names, but they're really, really well-known <laughs> indie wrestlers that are awesome. Like, a bunch of my favorite people are going to be on there, honestly. So if you guys need some tickets if you're going to be in Vegas around March 14th. Um, the show's going to be great, and I'm helping sell tickets. So if you need some, I'm your hookup. <laughs> but um, I wish I could think of more names. Dink, put the names down. I can't think right now. But I was really <laughs> impressed with who's on the card, to be honest. Is that something you could see yourself doing? Like once the MMA career is starting to wind down is start going the pro wrestling route? Yeah. Yes. I, yes. But I don't, um, I don't like, I'm trying to leave it open. You know, I don't know what I exactly want to do yeah. when I'm done, but that's definitely not something I wouldn't do. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, having kind of grown up in MMA with Shayna right on my shoulder uh, it almost feels like I should, you know, like right. it's something that's part of my, my lineage. But um, I, it, I'm so glad that I had the chance to be around Shannon for many reasons, but that would be one of them where she, she helped me understand how wrestling is MMA and vice versa. And it's really, it's, it's already helping me feel like I get the game a little bit better than maybe some people that are starting out. Right. So it's helping me build my brand and my character and, you know, you want to be interesting. You, it's not enough to just be 
be winning fights or even be winning fights entertainingly. You've got to be entertaining outside of that. Yeah. You really do. So I'm grateful for the education I was given in that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was I going to say here? Sorry. Message to read. Oh, here it is. Uh, Steampunker wants to know, what's your go-to meal after the cut is complete and the weigh-in is over? What did I go eat? Uh, Besides the cookie. A lot of bread. So we went... Um, you're supposed to kind of keep what you're eating mild and then similar to kind of what you were eating about a week out from the final cut. Um, just cause your body has a really hard time processing everything. So, yeah. um, everyone's different. I know like, I know Jessamine goes and gets like a big thing of spaghetti right after, um, red, red meat and stuff like that sometimes doesn't sit well with me even when I'm like, to wait or whatever so yep. anyway we went and i like breakfast food so we went and got like eggs and toast which are simple and then i had like a big plate of french toast so i just <laughs> ate like a loaf of bread pretty much and semi regretted it because it just sat right on top of my <laughs> belly for like 12 hours uh, i think i woke up at like 4 a.m fight day and was starving though like once that processed i was like where's more and all i had because like i didn't really eat anything but eggs or egg whites and spinach for like a week straight yeah so that's I disgusting. Had nothing I was, I, you can convince yourself this is so good <laughs> believe me when you're that hungry and you're eating like 300 calories a day or something stupid and you get a real egg <laughs> like one real egg for the day you're like yes yeah, so um Everything tastes like magical at that point. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, but I found I had got these cookies, and I'm not really really an advocate for people eating like junk food before they fight. But I had like nothing else to eat, and I was like, "Well, you need the calories." So I ate a cookie. Well, that's the thing. Like once you start like leveling to where you are and where you're going to be, I mean, the diet plays such a huge part in that. And it's yeah. a, it's an everyday thing. I mean, I did a diet three years ago, four years ago now, where it's like a keto diet. So you eat their shitty egg whites and all that crap for a week, but then like Sunday's <laughs> your cheat day. So I would eat like a yeah. large pizza and have a case of beer. You know what yeah. I mean? I just binge out. But it's funny because they're like, oh, cheat day. And it's like, I've had diets like that as well. Um, and you pretty much negate any work you put in. Like there's a limit for sure. You know, right. I think... I think once a month, if you're doing a diet like that and you're allowing yourself a cheap meal <laughs> once a week, and it can be a big meal. You know, I'd say double double or triple like your portion size and then just like a lot of fat, a lot of carbs because your insulin levels need that. But anyway, I would say once a month, go for the day and just like kill it. I would. Oh, for sure. Why not? Uh, Big Stinky Moose has a question for you. He wants to know uh, why he decided to get a theater degree instead of a real job. What? <laughs> yeah. Like, how we is can that ignore not him, a real said. job? <laughs> how is not a real job? His theater degree? Uh, I don't know. He's really down on himself here. Come on, man. <laughs> your job's cool, and I've seen your work. Yeah, his, uh, I, I talked about it on the first podcast about his YouTube channel, and... Yeah, he definitely does a lot of cool things with his work, for yeah, sure. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he is kind of a total douchebag. Uh, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else do you want to talk about? Anything. Like, I love the questions. Like, it makes Yeah, me keep the questions coming, you guys, yeah, so we don't have to wrap this up. There's not really much that's off topic, so I don't, whatever. <laughs> How much weight do you cut for a fight? Like, what do you usually walk around at, and then what do you weigh in at? And then... So it's a it depends a little, you know, um, like for this fight, uh, and in the winter time, I think most people carry a little bit of extra weight. Um, and we got the fight a little bit after Christmas and I didn't try to eat very healthy during Christmas. So, um, I was about 135, which is like the heaviest I'll kind of let myself walk around at usually. It's not like atrocious, but it's, I'm chubby, um, <laughs> athlete chubby. When I get, when I was going to say, I'll show you chubby. <laughs> when, when I'm, I'm being like more conscious and lean and stuff and keeping up on my runs I'm like 128 to 130 um and then we cut to 115 so this was a this was a, a good process I mean I was hungry for 10 days um and then I didn't have to cut a lot of water weight at all um it was a very safe cut 
But I don't – I think I found my weight class for sure. Like, I – making 25 is not a cut at all, you know? Yeah. If I miss, like, a couple meals, I'd be 25. So that's not a real cut. And those girls are way too big for me to – well, I don't ever want to say that because I, I plan to – as I as I advance, I'd like to hold more than one belt. I think that's anyone's goal at this point. Oh, for sure. But um, to for where I'm at now, I don't plan to fight heavier unless it's a catch weight, which I'm not a fan of either. But I don't know. It'd have to be the right factor. And then I definitely don't think I could take 10 more pounds off of what I was to be a 105er. <laughs> so the team's where I'll stay. And it, um, it was a very safe process. I have a good team around me. Do you find that... Like, so you're, you're cutting the weight for, I'm assuming for tough enough, the weigh-ins were the same, like the day before. Do you find that like, you're still trying to gain energy back from the weight cut when you step into the cage? I didn't feel that way, fortunately. Um, but I've heard people say that, you know, that they feel like they didn't. And so I, I was trying to figure out why that was, you know, um, maybe it's just like, my size and stuff where 15 hits in a space where I don't drain too much out of me, you know, right. I, I don't, I don't know for sure. I'd like to work with some doctors and kind of figure out why that went so well for me. Um, but I definitely cut weight. Like I said, when we started camp, you know, over the course of, you know, six weeks or something like that, I pretty much cut 20 pounds, which is a long span to do that. And, but I'm also not very big, you know, the smaller, the fighter, um, the more weight you cut, the harder it is on you because yep. you have to think about the percentage of your body. Like I just pretty much cut almost 20% of my <laughs> mass. You know, that's a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know. It went well, though. I'm glad for that. So now that we've said something, people are actually rolling the questions in. Uh, okay, the cool. text Ferguson wants to know, what's the best flavor avocado ice cream? Oh, that's a great question. I'm weird, and I really love vanilla ice cream like across the board. So I right. love their vanilla, but, um, they're the other one that I would say is my favorite would be the mint chocolate chip. What is auto? I've never even heard of avocado ice cream. So they've got all these alternative ice creams out now, right? Like halo top, coconut, whatever, almond milk, whatever. And it started out like, like Jesse and our like friends would come over and at night we would just like watch movies and eat fake ice cream. <laughs> but we were like, crap, dude, we're spending like a ridiculous amount of money on all this alt ice cream, right? Because um, dairy, we don't really eat a lot of the dairy and stuff in our diet. Like, I think uh, it's just, it's one of those foods that's like an inflammatory food. Yeah. And people think that's really goofy until you know the difference. And as an athlete, it's important. So we don't really eat any dairy. And um, I found this company. And so their base is avocados, which makes sense. It's really creamy. And so then it's like vegan and it's all these things, non-GMO, things that I try to kind of stick to to be a little bit more healthy. Yep. Um, and then they had an ambassador program. So I ended up getting a chance to work with them. And um, yeah, it's good stuff. It doesn't taste avocado-y. The only thing that's reminiscent of avocado is just like how creamy the texture is. Right. Yeah. Do you kind of stick to like a vegan diet as you're cutting weight and then go back to chew a steak afterwards? Or you just kind of follow that all along? Uh, yeah, but a little of both. Like I'm not, I'm not a vegan. Like I don't, I'm red blooded redneck American. So <laughs> yeah. um, I like, yeah, <laughs> I like chicken and cheeseburgers, but I didn't grow up really eating much beef. So beef and I have a bit of a volatile relationship. Sometimes it doesn't sit well with my body, but right. I like, I like the taste. So for me, when I get into the last like two weeks of the cut, like I have a program to follow and then I go a little bit rogue because I just know my body. So I won't eat meat within the last like two weeks to 10 days or so. Right. Um, Cause I'm trying to give my body stuff really easy to process and that's not going to put any weight on me. So uh, for my protein sources, I'll still eat eggs. And as we get closer and closer, it'll, it'll just be egg whites or if I'm lucky, I get one real egg a day. <laughs> um, and then it's greens to keep everything moving. So, um, yeah, my digestion did great this time. Like, um, there's been other diets I've been on when I wasn't competing that I couldn't use the bathroom for, like, four days. Yes. And 
that's not good. <laughs> and I could, I couldn't get past like 129 pounds. Um, and now I'm able to cut all the way to 15 and, and still use the bathroom. So I'm happy about that. And still be able to fight. Like that is crazy. Yeah. Weird. Like it's always a, a bit of an experiment. And when you're, when you're on the newer end of things too, like a lot of it's my job to at least ask questions, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so one of the best things I can tell anybody to do if they are thinking of competing or, or any of that is that I went, when I trained the wrestling team and I said, I'm going to cut weight with the team the whole season. Um, and so I made 125 at least once a week, if not twice a week. Um, and I was walking around about 135 at the time consistently my problem was one, I didn't know how to cut weight. Like I was looking yeah. up all these things, but I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, two, I would, since I was part of the staff, they would allow me to come into the coaches' rooms filled with like donuts and <laughs> cookies and Subway. And so I would make weight and I'd run back to this room and gorge myself <laughs> and then go get more and more. And then it would be cheat day. So, like, my family and I would go out and get wings and stuff, and I would put on, you know, 10 pounds and then have to wean it down and then cut weight. And so it was horrible. But point being, go out and screw up some weight cuts. Because <laughs> <laughs> it'll teach you a lot, though. Like, I learned how my body responded to this or that. Yeah. I learned what not to do. I learned what questions I needed to ask. So it's just the same as, like, if you're going to go out and, and learn how to do jiu-jitsu, do a bunch of open mats and a bunch of rolls get caught in a lot of submissions and then you have questions to ask. So it's the same. Right. See, I've watched a lot, like, especially watching the ultimate fighter. Love that show. Uh, watching like all the UFC embedded, especially the last episode before the fights and they show weight cutting and stuff like that. That whole process just looks like hell to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Mine wasn't like that, but it wasn't a cakewalk either. I think part of it is mental where you decide like, okay, we're going to do it. Hell or yep. high water. And you just, there's, there's brief moments where you've got to lean on your team some, cause it, it's uncomfortable. And I'm sure some of my friends were tired of hearing me talk about how hungry I was. Cause <laughs> that's some of the most hungry I've been. And it doesn't affect me super bad during the day, especially when you're water loading. Cause your, your body still thinks you're full, right? When you have a certain level in there and you can trick it with water. So to help everything go properly, you get up to drinking about two gallons plus a day. Right. And um, that helps. But when it's nighttime and you're trying to sleep, something happens. And you're just like, I'm so hungry. so <laughs> stupid. So I'm like texting certain people that are my support system. I'm like, I'm so freaking hungry. And so what I end up doing is watching a lot of YouTube. There's this guy, Randy Santel, who's like a competitive eater. Right. He's got a billion videos up, so I'd be like, I'm craving pancakes, doo -doo 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 -doo, and watch him eat a whole bunch of pancakes. I'm like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and uh, so, like, on the questionnaire for the fight, because they, they're trying to get to know you, so they have something to commentate. Yeah. And one, one of the things was, um, like, what have you done to prepare for this fight? And I answered, I watched a lot of Randy Santel eating challenges. <laughs> like, uh, it's true. It's an integral portion of training. <laughs> like, Steve, I was at that point where I was dieting. And I started watching YouTube videos. I think I'd want to eat my phone. <laughs> it gets pretty. It gets pretty bad. There's little tricks though. Like you end up chewing a lot of gum. Yeah. Um, you need to have like weird flavors that keep you interested. Like I'll end up getting tropical tangerine or like something I would never <laughs> normally chew. Um, a really good trick I learned this time was so I'm like I've never been tested for it, but my dad has it, and I'm hypoglycemic. So right. Um. Cutting weight doesn't, like, I can get past it mentally and everything, it, but you'll get a head rush sometimes when you, like, stand up out of the bathtub or stand up out of the sauna. Right. Um, and my blood sugar's, like, way down. So my teammates were like, hey, in the future, bring yourself, like, one Hershey kiss or have some Jolly Ranchers, and that will save you. And so after we made weight, like, hadn't weighed in, but we were on weight for when we did weigh in, I had, like, yep. seven hours or five hours or yeah forever <laughs> and you're so hungry and you have nothing to do but think about weighing in so they gave me they limited me to five jolly ranchers they're like go go home like turn on a movie lay down but you can have these and they won't affect your weight and i felt nine thousand percent better after i ate all those and then 
it was weird. Like I got to weigh-ins and it was like I had, I don't know if it was just a mental thing where I was like, now you're on, like you got to be in character. And I had like a specific outfit, like I had a job to do, you know? Um, I wasn't, I never treat any of it like it's just another thing to go do. It's always like a, a it's a show. So I felt great by the time I got there. I don't know how. And then it was like, (laughs) cool, time to eat. Let's go. And yeah, it was just a great weekend in general. It was awesome. Uh, Queen's Army wants to know how hard it is to balance a personal life with fighting and working. Yeah, I think it's, um, it can be difficult for sure. And I think it's with anything. I think it's not just with fighting. Like, life is not easy to balance in general, no matter what you're doing. Um, But I guess if I think about how I do that, my number one priority is my training always. Everything revolves around that. Everything. And I and I tell my my teammates and things that are newer to this or younger, like earn your free time. You know, like you once you accomplish your goal, you have forever after that to just be a dork and do whatever you want to (laughs) do. You know, like really if you want to drink yourself silly for the rest of your life, cool, but yeah. You won't have the, the money or the clout or any of that stuff if you don't focus now. So that's my number one. And then I am a very social person. So um, when I have those off times or those down moments, like I, I do make that a priority as well because I, I've hit patches where I'm burnt out and it's, yeah. it becomes too much. So I try to get outside of that, go shoot some guns, go hiking, uh, just lay around and tell jokes and watch movies with friends, like whatever it can be. But just um, distract then, yourself out of that mood, kind of. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, I have to work to eat and I got to eat to train. So you just kind of prioritize everything. Like for me, that's how I look at it. And, you know, there are days, this phone for real. <laughs> <laughs> there are days when, you know, things get frustrating and whatever. And that's just being a human. So this actually goes good to the next question uh, from Whit Cranford. Uh, just she just says, "Can you talk about some mental prep for fighting?" Oh, uh, oh sorry. yeah, you're still good. <laughs> I'm still here. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to like. I don't know why this isn't working to plug in because my battery is down pretty low. Give me one second. Technical difficulties. All right. Mm. So while she's doing that, let's talk about hot dogs. They're delicious. <laughs> She says they're gross. She's wrong. (laughs) (laughs) You guys can still hear me though, right? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, I'll answer the question. So what was it again? Mental prep? Uh, Yeah, just your mental prep for fighting. Are we talking about... I would just assume she means just your mental prep coming up to the fight. Yeah, it's so it's peaks and valleys, and from what I hear from everybody, it's kind of like that. Like, you'll get the fight, you're super stoked, and you feel like, yeah, I'm going to beat this chick, right? Like, you're, right. you're on it. And then you'll have a bad day of training at some point, and you'll go like, what am I doing? You know, like, you go through this little thing, and then you get over it and realize that it was just a bad day, and you can have a bad yeah. day doing anything. And then everything starts to click and go well with a few bad days here and there. Um, but I've learned to really push those days away. Like, okay, that happened. It's not happening anymore. What's next? Yeah. Um, and, and that's helpful because it'll translate to rounds, right? Like if you go in and get your ass kicked for a whole round, you can't come in and still feel like you're going to get your ass kicked. It's your turn. Like you have a chance to redeem yourself. So that's helped me learn how to do that better. Um, and then for whatever reason, three weeks out from your fight, nothing works. Like, you suck at everything, no matter what you try to do. Like, it's just terrible. The weight cut's starting to happen and, and hit you, and it's rough. And then <clears throat> the fact that I know that's going to happen, though, kind of helps me prepare for that. Right. And for whatever reason, my week two is always great. Like, everything starts to click. And then you're in fight week. And then that's when – I think that's when a fight can be lost for somebody. Oh, for sure. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of loose ends, and and sometimes you start overthinking. So that's when I think it's important to be a little distracted. Like go do some fun stuff. Yep. Um, and something Roxanne Modafferi taught me, who was a former teammate of mine. She said, "Hey, those thoughts, no matter who you are, how long you fought, whatever, they're gonna come into your brain." She goes, 
you can choose to really follow that rabbit hole and get upset, or you can replace them with something positive. So if you're if you start thinking about something crazy like, what if she knocks me out? You can go, yeah, okay, but my striking has improved so much, so I'm not worried about that or whatever. Yeah. You know, so on the actual fight night, when a little bit of nerves creep in, that's what I do. I just replace my thoughts, and then I I just tell myself that I'm great. You know, and that this is my night and really believe it. And when you step foot in there, it's like I said, it's like that's your one moment to be as arrogant pretty much as possible. But you got to believe it. You yeah, got to really sure. believe that like, yeah, nothing. I'm invincible right now. It doesn't matter. And that doesn't mean you come out there with your hands down and look like a clown. But <laughs> you just believe that you're capable and go get it done. I don't know. Oh, that for was sure. a really no, totally long explanation, I think. I don't know if that's No, it meant. explains it perfectly. <laughs> like, you've got to own the moment, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not be afraid to. Like, I've, I've, I've worked through that where you, maybe you, I'm looking for another charger. That's what I'm doing, <laughs> so we know. That's all good. Where you, you hit this, you hit this point, at least I did, where I almost didn't feel like I was worthy of winning. And that stems from a whole bunch of stuff in life. But um, once I overcame that and then solidified it with a definite win, now I'm over that. You know, now I yes. know I deserve to win. And, um, yeah, if, if that's your issue, like, I promise you can get past it. But you got to work at it actively every day. And I'm already thinking about the next fight. And I've got to maintain that mentality because I know that was a big factor in me going out there and just fighting and not overthinking anything not holding back on anything so yeah 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 uh can you verify for everybody what roxanne is like in real life is she like the absolute <laughs> sweetheart she comes across as she's very sweet she's very helpful she's uh she's a great teammate you know um she definitely has had a influence on my game and things like that but yeah she's a <laughs> She's pretty much a real live anime character. <laughs> That's what she's like. Uh, Big Stinky Moose wants to know what you do for flexibility. Oh, now it's doing it, I guess. Uh, flexibility. I'm terrible. Like, uh, <laughs> when I'm trying, though, I do uh, yoga. There's, oh, um, just just there's this, There you go. Yeah. There's this YouTube um, channel that's like, yoga for bjj is what it's called um and that's really good because it's hip focused and that's a lot of times what's tight um i do cars which i couldn't teach you how to do because it's specific and i always learn it from someone else but um that's like a mobility specific workout right um but i don't know i've been i've been feeling more flexible lately in general so i guess that's good but yeah it is it's important if you have a hot tub or something like that, that always helps keep you more loose. If you have a, a cryo chamber, if you have a, a good PT or chiropractor that knows how to do scraping, that's what I do. Um, my shoulders get really tight because I have some injuries from the past. Right. And my, my chiropractor will take his, uh, his scraper deals and go for it, and that helps out a lot. And there goes the camera again. <laughs> Yeah, one second. Oh, it's all good. We'll actually start wrapping this up because my neck's actually starting to get pretty sore now. Uh, but before I go, uh, obviously, doing this full time costs money. Are there any particular sponsors you want to throw out there or say thanks to anything like that? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I'm so grateful for my sponsors. Um, let's see. So for this fight in particular. Um, Bareface Inc. LV, which is a tattoo shop here in town. If anyone is making a trip here or anything like that, needs a, a good new clean place to go that also does uh, lashes and microblading, let me know. I'll set that up for you. Um, Nailed and Lash, that's my salon. They keep me looking fresh. Um, where else? Uh, Team Shorty Torres, uh, Solstice, Total Nutrition for keeping me fueled up, uh, Cotto Ice Cream. And am I forgetting anybody? Always shout out to uh, Dr. Jacob Steckel for being my Cairo. Um, Undaunted Apparel for printing my stuff. Um, Isla for printing up badass fight kits. And 
should have been more prepared than this. Juice There's box. so many. I put you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Juice box. This is a good problem to have. Um, you know, 10th planet for having me. Um, I feel like I, there, oh, there was somebody else. Oh, Lane Frost brand, of course. They're awesome. And I think that about wraps it up. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions or thinks of any questions or anything they want to ask you, how can they get a hold of you? Um, I'm super active on Instagram. Um, anywhere you hit me up, I'm going to answer you eventually, unless you're being creepy. Um, so my handle is Chelsea Ray MMA. So C H E L S E A R A E M M A. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I know there's a lot of people that were looking forward to it. Well, I appreciate you having me and for people coming to hang out, asking questions and actually caring about what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, a lot of people did for sure. I like it. Oh, you said, awesome. like we've been watching you for how long now and, and I'm glad that we're doing this, you know, this podcast on a good note after a win. Cause I mean, first off, you've been working your ass off of this. You kind of deserve it. You know what I mean? Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> All right, Chelsea. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to y'all later. All right. So that is it for episode three. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was definitely awesome to talk to Chelsea. I've been a big fan of MMA for so long, but I'm, I'm, I'm just a fan. I just see what I see on the TV screen. I don't know how to go in depth. I don't know what happens in depth. So it's nice to kind of like talk to her. Got to get that behind the scenes stuff. And again, congratulations on her win. Uh, can't wait to see what she has coming down the road. Uh, as far as coming down the road for the 8A podcast, I am working on a few local guests actually, so that we'll actually, this podcast won't take place in front of a green screen. It'll actually take place in front of the bar in my basement, kind of a different vibe to it, kind of a different thing, but, uh, yeah, that is it for the 8A podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining in. I hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next time. Hey, this is Jordan. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, follow me on Twitter at the A Day Podcast, all one word. Participation is absolutely free, but if you want to help out, check out my Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash the A Day Podcast. And I hope to see you again. I've been into cities and I dabbled in small towns Wasting in Cancun and I tore the damn walls down Partied on red miles, sipping on moonshine Prayed to porcelain gods and I crossed lines Some say I lost it but I didn't be a bitch